Hello, intro students. So I've decided I'm going to do a series of video lectures uh, to help prepare you for the first exam. So the first exam is going to be covering chapters one and chapters two out of the Hensel and Chex, uh, textbook. Uh, in this video, I'm going to be going over a good portion of chapter one, and then the next in chapter two. <clears throat> so, to start off with, um, the main things that you're going to be tested over in uh, the exams are going to be uh, the bolded terminology, the, the key terms. And so I really want you to get those key terms down and to start using them in your discussions. And so I want sociological language to become a part of your everyday lexicon or your everyday vocabulary that you use. So I'm going to go through and I've published uh, the notes for you on Blackboard. Um, but I'm going to go through and try to clarify some of the things. Um, so if you want to pull up your notes and follow along, um, I'm going to be going through that. So first of all, we've got the sociological perspective, sociological imagination. Now, they sound like they would be the same thing. They're taught in the textbook like they are the same thing, but there are slight differences between the two. The sociological perspective is more general, and it, it simply means just placing whatever you're talking about within the broader social context. And over, <clears throat> over the course of this semester, we're going to be constantly doing that over subject um, uh and subjects and subjects and subjects, we're going to be um, saying, okay, so this is what is occurring. Now, how can we understand this from a much broader perspective? The sociological imagination comes from uh, the 20th century sociologist C. Wright Mills. Now, C. Wright Mills was a lot more specific in what he meant by the sociological imagination. And he said that the sociological imagination requires you to be able to, to take into consideration three main things. That you need to be able to take into consideration the history of the society because nothing ends up springing from nothing. So the present springs from the past. So if you're going to understand the present, you need to understand the past. Then uh, you need to look at the structure of that society. What type of society are we looking at? Is that society organized by a caste system, status system, a class system? Um, is it more egalitarian? Uh, what kind of society are we talking about here? Uh, how is your place within that society determined? These are all things that you would have to take into to consideration. And then finally, uh, your individual biography. If you want to place and understand an individual within its, uh, their broader social context, you would need to be able to understand the individual biography within the broader context of the history of the society, as well as the way that the society is organized. So while the sociological perspective and sociological imagination are kind of the same thing, the pers sociological perspective is more broad and general, and the sociological imagination is far more specific. All right, so um, society is simply people who share culture and a territory. So anytime you hear us talking about uh, society, we're talking about people who live in relatively close proximity to one another and share certain core cultural values. Now, this leads us to someone's social location. The social location is something that you're born into, and it's something that in some societies you can change. In other societies, uh, you're, you're stuck uh, wherever you're born. And so our social, every society, every person within a society has a social location. In the United States, your social location is going to be determined by multiple factors. 
groups. It's going to be determined by the uh, economic uh, class you were born into, the, ec the educational class you were born into, uh, what race or ethnicity you were born into, um, what sex you were ascribed at birth, what gender identity that you identify with, uh, what sexual identity you identify with, all of these kinds of things will end up impacting your social location within American society. But different societies have different ways of factoring social location. It depends on what that society determines as being most significant in defining individual categories for people group, or groups of people. And so our social location is not just our place within society. It also uh, defines the time period in which we're living. And so, you know, an American living at the uh, beginning of the 19th century is going to be very different from an American living at the, um, the 20, or beginning of the 21st century. And so um, in this sort of way, we can see that time and uh, where you fit within the society are all going to determine how you see the world, how you understand the world. We can even see that today. So for instance, um, a big part of differences in perspective comes from what we sociologists call the division of labor. So, you know, it's some people do jobs like uh, uh, Transportation, driving trucks, for instance. Um, some people end up working uh, retail. Some people uh, become teachers. Some people become doctors, lawyers, politicians, what have you. Now, uh, <clears throat> most diversity within modern so industrialized societies actually comes from the division of labor more than anything else. And so somebody who has a career as a truck driver is going to have very different experiences and interactions uh, than somebody who is a teacher. And so the teacher and the truck driver may live at the same point in history and may live in the same society. They may even um, share things in terms of economic class, in terms of uh, uh, race, ethnicity, sex, gender, sexuality, all of these sorts of things. But at the same point in time, because they have different careers and work in very different sectors of the American economy, they're going to have very different worldviews from one another. That's unavoidable. Anytime you have a highly divided uh, labor force like we do in, mo in all modern societies, you're going to have a high degree of diversity in terms of perspectives. Now, one way to illustrate this is uh, by using the language of media theorist Marshall McLuhan. He described us as living in a global village. Now, by global village, you kind of have to break down what he means by that. And you have to understand that some sociologists separate out the history of humanity as a species into three major epochs or three major categories. So modern humans, as best we know from archeology span um, uh, and anthropology, uh, modern humans evolved about 200,000 years ago. So we've been on this planet for about 200,000 years in this form. I mean, humans as a species go back millions of years, but modern humans, 200,000. All right. So from about 200,000 years ago until the Industrial Revolution, which is typically dated to the 1760s, we lived in what sociologists characterize as pre-modern society. Then from the 1760s, uh, largely dated at uh, the invention of the first industrial, the first steam engine with industrial applications in 1763 in England as the birth of the Industrial Revolution also begins what we call modern society. 
Now, modern society is an epoch that lasts from the late 18th century or 1700s up until about World War II, or a little bit after World War II. So that would be the modern era, the era of industrialization, the era of factories, the era of manufacturing and industrializing societies, um, the era of uh, rationalizing everything, rationalizing you know, how you get your food, how manufacturing is occurring on the, uh, an assembly line to um, how food is produced, how clothing is produced, uh, everything, mass manufacturing, right? One size fits all. Now that's modernity. Science becomes the main way of knowing things or what we call epistemology, which is a philosophical study of how we know what we know. And we'll be getting into epistemology a bit more in the section on methodology. When we talk about scientific methodology, whether it's in the natural sciences or the social sciences, we're talking about a kind of epistemology. How, when we claim we as sociologists uh, know certain things about how a society works, how do we know that? Where do we get this information from? We're not just sitting around making shit up, right? So, uh, when we get into the methodology, we're going to uh, get more into that. So, back to my example. Marshall McLuhan. Now, oh, wait, I didn't tell you. Uh, so... After World War II, everything changes. We have the rise of marketing. We have the rise of consumer economics over production-based economics. Um, the period in Western societies or those societies that industrialized first and typically uh, tend to be uh, European or descended from European cultures, we end up seeing um, them moving into what's characterized as postmodern society or postmodern culture. But uh, as we'll learn later in the semester, that, that designation is uh, relatively controversial. Um, but it's largely an argument about what to call things rather than uh, that, that things really did change um, following World War II in very significant ways. So Marshall McLuhan, the media theorist, comes up with this concept, the global village. So a village is the model of um, pre-modern societies. The city and the growing uh, urban areas with its industrial, uh, industrialized site and industrialized labor uh, represents the modern era. And the postmodern era would be best represented by the shopping mall. And uh, whether it's a physical shopping mall or a virtual shopping mall like Amazon, it doesn't matter. Um, now, the global village is a postmodern concept. It's the idea that uh, postmodernity and premodernity have more in common with one another than postmodernity and modernity do. So, in this sense, we end up living in many ways like a premodern village while simultaneously being globally connected with one another. For those of you who are interested in this kind of thinking and, and uh, these ways of making sense of the world in really big, big perspective kinds of ways, take my social, uh, social theory class. We will go in detail on these kinds of issues in that class. Um, but one way to talk about it would be instant communication. So in the postmodern era, we have communication at the speed of light. And so that as far as we're concerned, that's near instant communication. Now, if we consider that, so if something happens on the other side of the world, like an earthquake, we know about it immediately. However, um, to compare the with the modern era, look at the War of 1812, where England tried to take back the North American colonies. Um, the War of 1812 ended, and two weeks after the treaty was signed, we had the Battle of New Orleans. Is that because uh, the, the British and American forces were just itching to go after each other um, <laughs> in the Gulf? No. 
uh, it's because they didn't know that the war had ended. Uh, it took uh, more than two weeks to get information uh, to that particular battlefront that uh, the peace treaty had been signed. And so this, this instant communication is uh, difficult to overemphasize its importance uh, in uh, developing what we call a postmodern society or, or a postmodern um, civilization. So let's talk about the origins of sociology. And we're going to be getting a little bit into epistemology here or the study of how we know what we know. And um, in sociology, we're an amalgamation. And so what does that mean? Amalgamation is a kind of a combination of a bunch of different things. And so for sociology, and this is one of the things that I find personally most appealing about the discipline, is that it's a little bit of history. It's a little bit of philosophy. It's a, it's a little bit of the humanities. It's a... It's a little bit of economics, it's a little bit of political science, uh, a little bit of psychology, but then it also brings its own perspective um, to this. And so you're able to end up uh, studying just about anything in sociology that humans are connected with. And since humans are the, the dominant species on this planet, and we end up impacting everything on this planet, then almost Everything in the world is under the purview of the sociologist for potential study. Now, that being said, we are a social science, and we do practice a scientific method. Now, sociology, though, is different from the natural sciences and even um, some social sciences like psychology. Psychology tries to understand humanity by understanding the individual. Sociology argues that that's backwards. You have to understand the group in order to understand the individual because the group makes up the individual. You can't start with the individual. That's not the basic unit of a society. The social group is the basic unit of a society. So um, one of the things that we uh, discuss is what's called scientific monism. Monism, M-O-N-I-S-M. That means one, or a reference to one way of doing things. Um, there is a, an Arabic poet by the name of Khalil Gibran who famously wrote, if uh, your only tool is a hammer, then every problem is a nail. Well, one example of this would be, for instance, psychology and their focus methodologically on only the experimental method. That would be an example of scientific monism, that they think that the only way to do science is through scientific experimentation, when that is just one of many different methodologies uh, that sociology employs. Now, for psychologists, it's much easier to, uh, to run experiments because you can pull an individual or a small group into a laboratory and control the conditions. What happens when you're a sociologist and you're trying to study an entire culture? You can't bring an entire culture into a lab and control every condition. So we sociologists have had to develop more complex scientific methodologies for studying humanity than what you would find in other sciences. Now, this all gets started by uh, a major founder of sociology, uh, the French thinker Auguste Comte. Now, Comte was the one who coined the term sociology. He also coined the term demography. <coughs> demography is a subfield within sociology that focuses on uh, statistics about big patterns in society. And so you use a lot of census data and things like that in demographics. Um, but this was all coming from Comte. Uh, now Comte lived, he was born uh, shortly after the French Revolution. And he was fascinated by what could possibly bring about something like the French Revolution. 
And so, um, you know, he, he looked at the philosophers of the day, uh, the theologians of the day, and they all had their different answers and their different reasons, but none of them seemed to be grounded in anything empirical. That anyone could sit down and, and kind of be an armchair philosopher and come up with these explanations. And so Comte's view was there's got to be a way to develop what he called positive knowledge, something that you can um, go out and study and observe using your senses and say, this is then the pattern that leads to these kinds of consequences. He called this application of a scientific approach to the social world positivism or the development of positive knowledge about the social world. Leading eventually to uh, the development of sociology itself, uh, the scientific study of society and human behavior, which is honestly such a, a broad definition of what sociology is. It's almost meaningless, but sociology is a broad discipline, so it's hard to define. Now, um, let's look at some of the intellectual underpinnings of this discipline we call sociology. The first person we're going to look at is kind of an intellectual monster of uh, the social science. He, he wasn't really a social scientist. He was a social philosopher. His name was uh, Herbert Spencer. He lived from 1820 to 1903. He was a British philosopher. He's the one who wrote Survival of the Fittest, and he came up with social Darwinism. And it had absolutely nothing to do with biological Darwinism. All right, so biological Darwinism. To understand how Herbert Spencer got this all wrong, you got to understand um, biological Darwinism. So let me give you a fast rundown. Now, keep in mind, this has all changed since we've learned more about genetics, and now we're into neo-Darwinism. So I am just talking about classical Darwinism here, all right? So in classical Darwinism, you have this broad distinction between natural selection and artificial selection. Artificial selection is what we humans have been doing for millennia with many different animals and plants. We, we've done it with horses, we've done it with corn, we've done it with wheat, we've done it with uh, pigeons, dogs. Dogs will be one of the best examples. I mean, it, it took us 30,000 years to move from uh, wolves to teacup chihuahuas. And so that also illustrates species differentiation when you have an accumulation of genetic differences or genetic drift. And so when you have the moment you, you no longer have wolves but have dogs, you, you have a new species. And it took us 30,000 years to uh, uh, breed dogs from wolves by selective or artificial selection of traits that we wanted to emphasize in later generations. Now, natural selection is when changes in the environment and pressures from the environment select which traits are most adaptable and then give the individual with those traits or individuals, plural, the edge in terms of reproduction to make sure that those genes get passed on and then get emphasized um, even to the point of species differentiation like what we get with artificial selection. Now, <clears throat> for biological Darwinism, this has an, almost nothing to do with individual genetics. Because in any given species, you're going to find the same genetic variations in multiple individuals. And you can't predict with 100% certitude what traits, what genetic traits are going to be most adaptable in the future. So what that means is the more varied your genetics are, or the more varied the genetics of the gene pool of the species is, the more likely that gene uh, pool or that species will be able to adapt to whatever environmental changes occur in the future. So you want as much genetic variety as possible if you don't want your species to go extinct, in other words. So for 
Charles Darwin's view, it was about the species as a whole. It was about the gene pool as a whole. It wasn't even about it individuals passing their personal genetics on to the next generation because I know everyone thinks they're they're special and unique but I promise you whatever genes you have there are other people in the world who have your exact same genes and so um, in this sense again it's about the gene pool as a species here's what Herbert Spencer just, uh, said with social Darwinism, he argued that we are now at a point scientifically when we can identify superior and inferior humans. And if we were to just go and round up people who we think of as being criminal or poor and sterilize them, that we could let them die in the streets and humanity will then be uh, improved and become a superior form of the species. Now, um, which group did he target the most? Uh, people with African ancestry. And so uh, social Darwinism is intimately tied with racism and ultimately led as a philosophy, ultimately led to Nazism and the Holocaust. And so social Darwinism and preaching the philosophy of survival of the fittest, along with Herbert Spencer, not something that has any scientific backing behind it whatsoever, and it leads to absolutely horrific consequences. Now, in America and in England, the precursor to what became Nazism in Germany and the Holocaust was called the eugenics movement. Now, eugenics is a Greek term. The prefix e, eu, means true or pure. Genics is a reference to blood. So if you wanted to translate it into English, it would be true or pure blood. Um, now, the eugenics movement was all about uh, putting uh, Herbert Spencer's social Darwinism into action. Keep in mind, Charles Darwin argued against social Darwinism in his own lifetime. Um, he rejected this uh, in applying it within a species or within a, a society the way Herbert Spencer did. And uh, the eugenics movement led to a lot of forced sterilizations of people um, who had done nothing wrong. We're in, we see the effect. Uh, uh, application of social Darwinism and the eugenics movement in America uh, lasting from for almost a hundred years. It lasted from the end of the Civil War and, and specifically, more specifically, the end of the Reconstruction period in the 1870s up until the 1970s. Um, so the eugenics movement was being practiced for about a hundred years in the United States before it was finally um, ended officially in terms of government support for it anyway. Now we're going to look at some other uh, intellectual underpinnings to sociology. There are the three big founders, the three big founders. Um, the three big founders are Karl Marx, Max Weber, and Emil Durkheim. So, <clears throat> let's start with Marx. Some of you have maybe have never heard of Marx. Some of you have probably heard of Marx, but um, think he is the devil incarnate. So, first of all, Karl Marx had nothing to do whatsoever with Nazism in any way, shape, or form. Um, Marxism and Nazism are actually polar opposites in terms of the political spectrum. Also, uh, Nazism is more of a political theory, whereas Marxian, Marxian thought is more economics than political. Um, so you can have an authoritarian government with a Marxian economics uh, system, uh, as well as you can have a democracy with a Marxian economic system. Um, and so it's, again, it's much more about economics. Now, Marx focused mainly on economic conflict 
and argued that most of humanity has been broken up into two major classes throughout the history of the species. And uh, basically the haves and the have-nots. And Marx coined the term class conflict to talk about this. Now, uh, conflict theory, which comes out of the original thinking of Marx, has become much broader, much bigger, much more diverse. And so anywhere you see conflict within society, this is the model um, that is used to try to understand how that conflict is occurring, typically. Now, for Marx, uh, in capitalist economics, he calls the two major classes the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. The bourgeoisie, which is where we get our slang term bougie from, <coughs> is French and means pound dweller. The bourgeoisie are those who are the capitalists, those who are the owners, the ones who own factories, the ones who own businesses, the, one who, the ones who own, you know, summer vacation homes in the Hamptons and their own private islands and a fleet of yachts. That's the bourgeoisie. The proletariat is anyone who has to work for a living. So, in Marx's view, if you've got to work for pay, you're a part of the proletariat. The bourgeoisie do not work. They live off of, inve off of investments. Typically, investments they didn't even make, but past generations made, and they're still living off of them, like trust fund babies. So, let's move on to Emil Durkheim. Now, Durkheim, like Marx was interested in what causes conflict in a society, Durkheim was interested in what caused cohesion within a society. So, oftentimes, their uh, theoretical perspectives are talked about like they're flip sides um, of the same coin, or sometimes they're talked about like they're polar opposites, but actually they work fairly well together. Uh, it's a question of emphasis, whereas Marx was emphasizing what caused conflict and what that conflict can lead to, Durkheim focused on what kept a society together. And he argued that we're all mutually dependent on one another um, through interlocking parts of a society. Kind of, you can think about it in terms of economics, like you need somebody to source raw materials, and then you need those raw materials to be made into um, items that can be assembled for whatever product, and then you need people to assemble those products, and then you need, this whole thing needs people who specialize in distribution to move all of these things around the world. And then finally, you need people who work in centers of distribution, like in retail, who then sell the final products. And so because we're all independent, are interdependent on one another, and none of us know how to do every little thing we need uh, to do to be able to survive um, without society as a whole, there's a high degree of social integration or cohesion that occurs. Now, Durkheim also famously wrote a, a uh, book-length study on uh, suicide. And you think, well, that's kind of a morbid subject to write a book on. Why would he do that? Um, well, I guess the same reason why Netflix would do uh, 13 Reasons Why. But um, besides the, my, my little sardonic joke there, um, the reason why Durkheim was looking at suicide is because people typically think of that as being a highly individualistic kind of thing, where someone's alone and uh, isolated from society. And, but even that has social influences. Why are they alone? Why are they isolated from society? And Durkheim found that that's only one of four types of, of uh, suicide, and that every last one of those types of suicide were connected to the type of broader society that exists, or that the person exists in. And so something that we typically think of being uh, as being very individualistic is actually very social. Now, the third person, uh, Weber, Max Weber. Weber is interesting here <clears throat> because Weber is uh, kind of straddling 
conflict theory and uh, the structuralism or structural functionalism or functional analysis, as your book refers, it goes by many names. But these are the theoretical schools that are coming out of Durkheim's thought. And so, um, whereas conflict and structural uh, functionalism are, are oftentimes presented as being opposites to one another, which is not entirely accurate, uh, Weber ends up providing a strong bridge between the two. And we can see this in the way that he criticizes Marx, because Durkheim uh, focuses on cultural aspects that bring people together. Um, and Marx focuses heavily on the economy, and Weber says, you know, Marx, you're, you're solid on economics, I agree with a lot of your economics, um, but you're missing something very important. You're missing other institutions within a society that are just as important as the economy. For Marx, everything came down to the economy. The economy was everything. Um, Weber said, well, what about culture? And specifically, what about religion? Uh, this is one of the things that Durkheim focuses on for causing social cohesion within a society. Marx talks about the ways that religion can be used to control a population or to inject conflict within a, a population. And so religion serves both functions in different ways. Now, Weber, um, in illustrating uh, the, the cohesion between structuralism and Marxian thought, uh, ends up talking about the... Uh, in his famous book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, this long history of capitalism as an economic system versus ca uh, the spirit of capitalism, which he sees as a kind of cultural ethos or a, a cultural way of making sense of the world, of operating within the world. And so um, for Weber, the Protestant ethic is this ascetic idea that originates in religion and is the idea that, <coughs> that you sacrifice your life for, for um, uh, the gods or a god or some kind of religious cause. Um, whereas the Protestant ethic um, used to be about religion, it becomes about economics. And um, this ended up occurring coming out of the Protestant Reformation that began in Germany in 1517. Uh, if you want to get specific, it's when Martin Luther, um, as the story goes, nailed his 95 theses or 95 arguments to the church door of Castleberry Church in Wittenberg, Germany on October 31st, 1517. Um, and at this sense, uh, they he ends up arguing, Martin Luther does, that there's this thing called predestination. And in many ways, Protestant Christianity uh, is an attempt to make uh, uh, Roman Catholic Christianity uh, reasonable and logical in the the sense of the Enlightenment era philosophies in terms of rationalism. And so what we end up seeing in this sense is, okay, this is Martin Luther and also the French theologian Jean Calvin. Uh, this is their logic. This is how they reason this out. And they say, okay, if you have an omniscient and omnipotent God, an all-knowing, all-powerful God, that created all of reality, knows everything that has ever happened, knows everything that ever will happen, then everything that has ever existed, everything that does exist, and everything that ever will exist already exists in the mind of God. Since it all already exists within the mind of God, we're just going through the motions and playing out God's plan. Which means that in Protestantism at its very root, free will is denied. It doesn't exist. Free will is an illusion because God has already decided everything that's going to occur because it's already been set in stone in the mind of God, which means that before you're even born, it's already been determined whether you're going to go to heaven or hell. 
and um, Protestants of the day, um, Lutherans and Calvin, Calvinists alike, ended up uh, focusing on this idea of predestination. You were predestined to go to heaven or hell. You're either a part of the damned or part of the elect. The elect go to heaven, the damned go to hell. So, in this sense then, um, this ends up causing a great deal of spiritual anxiety among groups of people, uh, such as the pilgrims, who were Puritans. Now, Puritans were those Protestants who were Calvinists, Lutherans, who wanted to purge the Anglican Church of England of all Catholic influences. And so that's where they get their name Puritan from. They wanted to purify Catholicism out of Christianity. So, the Puritans uh, end up coming over and founding the northeastern colonies of uh, North America and establish many theocracies, which was the real point. I mean, it's oftentimes the history is told as they were looking for religious freedom. And that's true, but they were just looking for religious freedom for themselves. Um, like, for instance, if you were a Quaker, um, from Pennsylvania, and you were, were traveling, moving to Pennsylvania um, from, say, Germany, and you got uh, a wreck in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, you only had three days to get your ass out of there, or they were going to kill you um, or do something else, uh, because you weren't allowed in there. It was a theocracy not set up for religious freedom for anyone, but specifically for the Puritans. Now, um, this ended up leading to a great deal of anxiety because you could be a Puritan and still be a part of the damned and do everything right, believe all the right things as they saw it, and still be a part of the damned. So this ended up, this anxiety led to a thriving um, trend of looking for signs. And signs could be anything. Um, uh, but typically signs, well, originally, signs were understood in a religious sense. And so if you were successful in some kind of religious endeavor, then it would be a sign that you were part of the elect. Now, over time, this ended up getting tied into economics. You also saw Luther's notion of the calling, um, which he meant in a spiritual sense, being wrapped up in the idea of occupation. So people talk about being called to teach, being called to the military, being called to this or that or what have you, and they're talking about occupations. Uh, that's actually sacrilegious uh, from Luther Calvin's perspective. Now, in this sense then, though, the signs ended up being uh, wrapped up with this economic system of capitalism. So, Let's split up capitalism as an economic system and the spirit of capitalism as a cultural system. Capitalism as an economic system, uh, we can say is beginning in its very early stages. So just starting at the end of the European medieval period, beginning of the Renaissance around the 14th, 15th centuries. Um, and again, keep in mind, this is still the, the age of mercantilism, which was the economic system and model that uh, was a precursor to capitalism. And so capitalism had not fully developed yet. And Weber even said capitalism as an economic system would have developed without the cultural aspect of the spirit of capitalism. But the spirit of capitalism that was created in the 16th century with Protestant Reformation just made uh, a strong ideological justification for writing moral judgments into people's economic class position. So in this sense, then, the spirit of capitalism in many ways is a way of judging people's moral worth based on their material possessions. 
And so in this sense, then, um, classes become just a natural way of organizing society because those who are most worthy rise to the top and those who are not worthy uh, will stay at the bottom. Now, as you'll find out as we go along in sociology and you learn more about sociological studies, that's not how our society works. That's not how um, any society really works. Um, and the myth of meritocracy or the idea that if you work really hard and you're just constantly working, that no matter what conditions you began in, you can rise to the top is simply not true. Um, now, are there exceptions? Are there, are there examples of people who, that achieve that? Yes, but you're talking about one in, in 300 million, um, the odds are better for you to rise in class standing by winning the lottery um, than by those kinds of methods. So in this sense, then, um, if you were wealthy or you were successful in a business venture, um, then that was taken as, as started to become taken as a sign by the 1700s that you were preferred by God. And so in this sense, then, um, you, people ended up uh, developing a moral justification. The rich are rich because they deserve to be rich. The poor are poor because they deserve to be poor. And Weber clearly is highly critical of this thinking because it's it's simply not true in any kind of scientific way. Um, for instance, just to give you a quick example, uh, you know, the, the best predictor of whether or not you're going to go to college, most people say, well, how hard you study, uh, how smart you are, right? No, nothing to do with it. The best predictor of whether or not uh, you're going to go to college is what your family income is. Best predictor, scientifically speaking. Which means that it doesn't matter how smart you are, or it doesn't matter how hard you study, um, that the economic system ends up determining a lot of what opportunities that you get to, uh, that you, you, you get to uh, take advantage of. All right, I'm going to stop here, and we will pick up um, with uh, more of Chapter 1 uh, later on. We've got a bit of time before your first exam, and so keep in mind it's just going to be over Chapter 1 and Chapter 2, and I will have all the lectures for Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 uh, finished by the time Exam 1 comes along. So be well, stay safe, and I will... Talk with you again soon.